tone, building for success through innovative construction. Mark Farmer is the CEO and founding director of the Cast. <coughs> Please welcome. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, in the room and online. Uh, I'm going to pick up the final session today, so I'm going to um, end with some thoughts about the future. Future home building, future construction, some of the challenges that we are facing as a sector, and what some of the answers may be to those challenges. And innovative construction is a key element of that. Um, it's something I've been pretty heavily involved with for seven or eight years. Um, of my career and latterly including with government trying to talk about some of the key issues and what government perhaps needs to do from a policy perspective what it needs to do as a client of the industry it's a significant client of the industry and if you think about what's happened over the last six seven years um, and some of you will know me for the a report that i wrote back in 2016 modernize or die there has been a litany of different reports and policy papers all talking about how we perhaps have to change how we do things in our industry. And even though that might get a bit tiresome, I think the actual new music here is that the government has realised that it needs a fit for purpose construction industry. It needs a healthy construction industry because we're an engine room of economic growth. We are one of the biggest employed sectors uh, and GDP contributors. We have a massive economic multiplier for every pound spent in our industry that three pounds to the wider economy. So we're really important. The government's realised that. And it's realised that actually the industry's got some big headwinds that it's facing into. And to try and counter some of those issues, it's trying to think about how it stimulates change, how it drives a different way of building homes, building schools, hospitals, even commercial construction. And one of the things that's really brought this home, that has actually been quite recent, all in the last 12 months or so, probably less than that, if you think about the amount of change that we've experienced in the wider market, geopolitically, in terms of something John's just spoken about, the pandemic, we thought we were coming to the end of the pandemic and everything was going to be a lot more positive, but we then had the conflict in Ukraine that has had um, a big impact on global supply chains, and we're now facing some real economic headwinds in relation to perhaps changing the economic cycle. All of that has direct impact on construction, we know from past experience that we are more susceptible to economic profile changes than other sectors. We are highly discretionary in terms of a lot of what we build. People turn the tap off more quickly than other things, such as food, retail, etc. Um, so we get affected and it tests our resiliency. And it's resiliency that really is at the heart of my concerns and what I've been talking to government about for many years now in terms of we have to prepare for declining resiliency. And what do I mean by that? So what we've historically had as an industry is an industry that's been able to navigate lots of twists and turns, lots of economic and geopolitical shocks along the way for over 100 years. It's created an environment where construction can be very flexible, it can shrink, it can expand. Uh, that is not without pain, but the industry has got very used to doing that. And actually at the heart of some of the flaws in our model, particularly things like subcontracting um, and the um, reticence to employ people directly, that is really born out of that resiliency that we've had in terms of being able to, to change the shape and size of our industry in response to external conditions. And if you look at that slide there, all the things that we're facing into now from market supply and demand drivers through to probably an unprecedented regulatory change environment, um, spanning lots of different things that, that we're having to face into, and then a broader external market around the end consumer and the money that sits behind the end consumer. All of those things are pretty heady cocktail of challenges that our industry is now being tested on in terms of its basic resiliency. And one of the graphs that I use a lot just to demonstrate what I mean by declining resiliency links to the labour force in construction. If there's one thing everyone probably is close to, particularly if you're running your own business, it's actually the problems we've been having increasingly in securing labour. Whether that is skilled labour on construction sites, whether it's professional services, labour, surveyors, engineers, put your managers, etc. It's been pretty tough the last few years. And if you look at this 
graph, it shows uh, something quite interesting. Um, and it shows the uh, total construction employment in the UK um, going back 20, 25 years. It shows the peak pre-global financial crisis um, and then decline uh, that we had in that recession and then the slow growth again up to COVID. And what has happened there is that actually we were unable to reinflate our labour force to the peak we achieved pre-global financial crisis. That is the first time that has happened since after the First World War, when a high male mortality rate in the war led to a situation where we were unable to grow the construction workforce. Now, what's happened since is we've had economic growth, we've had population increase, but we haven't been able to increase our construction employment. That is a really important lead indicator of the problems ahead around the resiliency of our industry. Because if we don't have labour in what is a labour intensive industry, we've got a major problem with how we're going to do production going forward. Some of this is also impacted by geopolitics, particularly the decision around Brexit, and it's also impacted by demographics. So we have an ageing workforce. All of you will probably experience the fact that the average age of workers on site is moving to the right, and we haven't got enough young talent coming into the industry to replenish. So we have a deterioration in terms of lack of replenishment of people retiring. Some people are retiring early, particularly if they've been on, in uh, site trades, and the physicality of that has affected their health and their ability to work with 65. We also have a Brexit-related impact to the fact that our younger demographic has been artificially supplemented by migrant labour. And that pool is no longer there, or at least it's diminished, and Ukraine has also further amplified that. So I'm just going to talk a bit about that, uh, the innovation that I think is needed to overcome some of that. So I talk a lot about modern metrics of construction. MMC is a term that everyone uses, and you know, it's, pretty, it's used pretty interchangeably. I'll come back to that in a second. But don't think innovation is modular. There's this perception that as soon as you talk about MMC, you talk about innovative construction, everyone's talking about modular construction. That is a misnomer. We Ultimately, what we need to do is change the proportions of how we build in terms of labour, plant and materials. It's as simple as that. That's the way you have to think about innovation. We have to change the mix of resources in construction. At the moment, we're too reliant on labour. And for the reasons I've just set out, if we continue to do that, we're going to hit the buffers in terms of our ability to have future-proof businesses that deliver the economic growth that the uh, government is expecting. So we just need to change those proportions. How we change that propor those proportions, there's many ways in which you can do that, and you can do it incrementally and gradually. It's not a big bang. MMC versus traditional is not a binary decision. And ultimately, everything that I'm talking about here will be forced. There is, this is not something that you can just get away with. Certainly over a five to ten year run, I would suggest there's no choice here. We have to think differently about how we build. And, as I've just suggested, actually the future-proofing of all of your businesses, your running businesses, particularly construction businesses, it will depend on thinking differently and having less reliance on skilled, traditional site labour, because it won't be there in the future. So that term MMC is used a lot. As I say, the one thing, if there's one thing I want to leave you with, don't think MMC is modular. Think broadly. So why do we talk about MMC? We want to overcome all the problems that I've just outlined in terms of big supply and demand drivers, the labour crisis that I, I think is going to um, further deteriorate, all of the regulatory challenges that we're facing, the investor challenges around um, what the money expects to see, <coughs> to see consumer expectations and new wave of consumerism. So we need better outcomes. Modern methods of construction is how we're going to do it. And what we're going to do is we're going to change the mix of labour, plant and materials. And that's what this comes back to. And there's a term called pre-manufactured value, which I have got there on the right-hand side. It's a percentage. And you should all start get, getting au okay fait with what PMV, pre-manufactured value, um, actually represents. Every job has a PMV. A traditionally built house has a PMV of about 40%. And what that means is 40% of the value of the construction of a house is materials. 60% is labour, the site processes, plant, prelims, etc. Um, if we're going to change our labour, plant, material mix, we need to increase our PMV. We need to have less site processes and more manufactured content. 
not modular. That's the key. That's the key thing that I would overlay here. This need to change that mix. So MMC is a term used a lot, in particular by politicians. So the one thing that's come out of my last six years talking to government is MMC is now a recognised term even at prime ministerial level, um, and that's a good thing. So this is about building awareness of how we're going to modernise construction, and MMC, for all its failings as a term, has got a lot of recognition. But it means a lot of different things to different people. One of the things that I was involved with um, about three or four years ago with DLUC, as it now is, levelling up the housing communities, is to define MMC. And this is a really useful document. If you use Google MMC Government UK, this is what comes up. And it's a seven category definition framework for MMC, particularly in home building. And it's a really important document because it creates a menu of how builders, particularly smaller builders, actually, this is really relevant for FMB in terms of the nature of the membership, can practically think about innovating how you build stuff. And admittedly, this is more about new build than repairs and maintenance. So apologies for, for those of you who are more skewed towards um, uh, uh, R&M. But this menu and the seven categories has a series of different techniques ranging from category one, which is modular, volumetric modular, boxes arriving on site, through to panelized construction, elements of structure that are non-systemized, through to sub-assemblies and non-structural elements of pre-manufacturing, um, traditional uh, innovative materials that require less labor to fit, and then through to site-based processes, nothing to do with off-site, what happens on the construction site. And for SMEs, actually, the action is in categories two, three, five, six, and a bit of seven. And what that represents is a whole series of choices for builders to think about how they do things differently, incrementally. No need for a big bang, no need to actually suddenly decide to do things in a way that is uh, foreign and potentially going to be high risk. You need to have go on a journey managing risk and understanding how you deliver a better outcome. And I'm not going to go through these, these images, but the, this gives you an idea of some of the things that we talked about in each of the categories. Category two would be very familiar to lots of you, timber frame, for instance, is included in uh, category two. Category three is structure that is pre-manufactured, so less labor required to put the structure together, but not necessarily whole house systems. Category five is non-structural. So it could be elements of internal fit-out, M&E, uh, utility cupboards, facade assemblies, all of these things require less labour on site at a time when we don't have the labour to put things together. Category 6, traditional materials, pre-casting, brick slips, um, push -fit, um, uh, pipes, large format masonry, all of it requires less labour per square metre or per metre of output. Really important to battle this labour scarcity issue. And then lastly, on-site processes, all about thinking differently about how you build. Might be as simple as building a roof on the ground and lifting it up. That's something that's becoming increasingly common, uh, including with SMEs. One of the things I would point you towards if you're interested in this whole debate, if you Google mmc.market, you'll go to a website, it's free to use. It is a resource for you to go through. It's a bit like Barber Index for MMC businesses. And um, this is categorized in the categories I've just gone through. So it gives you a menu to think about in terms of businesses you might want to approach if you're thinking about cutting your labor dependency on the site. And my personal view from a, having spoken to lots of SMEs about this, is that this menu approach to how you innovate, you just need to think about elementally on your build, starting in the ground, because the innovation starts in the foundations, then the structure of the building, then the fits out of the building and the engineering services that goes in the building. Each of those four areas creates opportunity to take labour out of site processes just by making choices across those categories that I've outlined. And what you do in all of that is you increase that PMV that I was speaking about. And there's a bell curve for your job. If you have a highly complex um, luxury house, for instance, that you're building, or a series of luxury houses in an estate, you're not going to be able to standardise much because I suspect the architectural details will be quite varied. But there will be bits that you can, and the PMV curve will be to the left because there's less to standardise. If you, you're building something that is in an easier planning environment and you're able to get repetition, that bell curve moves to the right. 
and it is very much a flex around your constraints on your project that enables you to deliver. <coughs> One of the things that we're just doing some statistical work on now, and it's, it's early days, but it's starting to bear out some interesting correlations, is that if you increase your peer V, you're proving better outcomes. Site productivity, movement on cost and schedule, speed, health and safety risk, if those are the proportions of hours worked, all of these things are better outcomes. And what's really interesting is the tier one main contractor supply chain is starting to be forced towards MMC. For many years, main contractor has just said, not interested, we just manage loads of subcontractors on site, and that's how that's our business model. Because of labour scarcity, that's the one thing I would point out that's forcing everyone towards this. They're now thinking about having partially vertically integrated supply chains, including manufacturing. And all of them are approaching that in a different way. Some of them are buying distressed companies, some of them are making deliberate ploys to um, integrate systemization into their build. But what's interesting is to understand what might be the SME version of this. That's probably not going to be going out by factory. I don't think that's tenable in terms of the investment required. But actually, I can see a really interesting environment where collaborations, joint ventures, alliances are built with the supply chain that enable you to access this different uh, way of building. And all of this is obviously caveated by the fact that if we're going to innovate in what we do, we need to take the warranty businesses with us, we need to take the insurance and the mortgage markets with us, otherwise we've got no market. And for me, that comes first. So a lot of the work I've done has been in building confidence, technical confidence and standards. Um, so these players are all really important in making sure that the MMC market develops in a sustainable way. And it is. And I'll finish by making the point that actually I've talked a lot about different methods and what's implicit in a different method, even though we've got less labour potentially in the future, is that labour that will be used to deliver those different methods has to be trained and skilled. So there is a people component to this that we can all too easily forget. And what's really important is, is understanding actually where the training and skills development happens in the industry, which is actually the SME part of the supply chain, the FMB members are a really good exponent of the type of employers that drive skills and training in our industry. And I suppose the challenge is, if we're going to do some of this stuff differently, particularly in both in retrofit and new build, particularly around decarbonisation and high productivity working um, and better quality build, what are those new skills that are going to be required? And I think that's the interesting challenge around you know, are we going to wait for CITB to do something here? And it's been a long time coming. I'm not convinced we've got the answer yet. Um, how can we get organised around driving a different type of hybrid skill? We still need bricklayers, but there's going to be an edge to this. We need bricklayers who can work with high precision dimensional tolerances and work with manufacturing context with different interfacing styles. This isn't an all or nothing. This is a hybrid spectrum on existing trade skills. It's that evolution through apprenticeships and different skills um, that are being taught in um, FE colleges that I think is going to be the real challenge that industry probably has to help cope with those. So uh, I've covered a lot there. Um, uh, I think these slides are going to be distributed so a uh, lot of the material that you can go through at your own leisure, but very happy to take questions. Wild. Right. I'm interested to know whether um, some of the supply shortages that we're seeing are affecting anything you've been described. Um, yeah, so in terms of material supply, a lot of the disruption that's happened on the back of the Ukraine conflict is um, doesn't discriminate as to whether it's supplying a factory, building many MMC products, or it's actually supplying traditional construction. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the disruption we're seeing in materials um, is pan pan industry. Um, what is clear though is that the, um, the issues around labour, which I pointed out, which for me is the bigger issue, because there's a structural decline in labour. The materials volatility, material supply volatility that we've seen, partly on the back of Brexit legacy, partly now linked to the, the, the conflict in, in Europe, um, I think will normalise and we'll get to a point where that sorts itself out. But labour, you can't stockpile trained labour. In there, no, it takes decades to bring that into maturity. That's the biggest risk for our industry. So, 
the, the issue of land labour, part of what why I sort of set that presentation out the way I have is that the anecdotes I'm hearing from CEOs of businesses, you know, tier one contractors through to SMEs is the same. You can't get enough labour. I was talking to an SME house builder um, a good four months ago who's telling me that actually because of the scarcity of bricklayers um, and the wages now commanded by bricklayers, particularly in London and South East, um, some bricklayers deciding they're earning so much money they'll just work a full day week. So they're actually withdrawing themselves from the labour market because they don't want to earn more and more. They say that's actually enough. I'm just going to work all day, all day and have three days off and have a better work-life balance. And it's a very job, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> that has huge implications for the output of our industry. It's a great resignation as it's turned. Um, any other thoughts? Yes. Hi, Mark. Um, um, modern construction in retrofit. What does that look like? Yeah, it seems so to me a very sort of people intensive way of delivering stuff, you know, high level of skill, you know, understand how buildings work. Um, and I think particularly older buildings, building them like in conservation areas, so that drives limitations to what you can do. So you can't go into like Victorian sort of building and chuck a load of right. space on the outside and a bit of render. I mean, you've got to be no. more. Yeah, no, it, it, it's, it, there's no two ways about it. The application of a lot of what I've just gone through in the repairs, maintenance, remodeling, retrofit market is more limited by virtue of the fact of what you just said. You're dealing with existing assets, you're dealing with constraints. Um, you can't come up with standard solutions for a lot of what you're dealing with. Uh, saying that, I think there's clear read across of some of the techniques that are being used, particularly around how you use digital technologies in some instances, how you use laser scanning for dimensional surveys, <coughs> how you can drive pre-manufacturing of component parts that might still go into an existing building. I'm specifically thinking about things like heat pumps and utility cupboards where they can be potted. Where the world of MMC and new build meets retrofit. And there is an interface there. There's some really interesting stuff that's happening in Holland with the Energy Sprung um, initiative where deep retrofit has an MMC component to it, where they're using those sort of things I've just said to expedite the level of retrofit or the speed of retrofit on a massive existing housing stock as we have in the UK. So it's not mutually exclusive, but actually if it's a Venn diagram, you know, it's that, that bit in between is less than what it would have been if it was just about new build work. So I think you have to have an open mind as to where the applications exist. I think the market will mature as retrofit hopefully becomes a, a real thing as, as regulations take us there. The, I'm pretty certain the market will innovate in that direction. Mark, thank you. Dare we must leave it. I really appreciate um, all your facts and figures and thoughts. Thank you very much indeed.